We greet all of you that are, have joined us in live stream. And we welcome all of you that are here to, with us tonight. It's good and pleasant for brethren to dwell together in unity. Amen. This, as Brother Judah has reminded us, will be the 16th message in the, on the subject of the coming of the Lord. <clears throat> now, the coming of Jesus is consistently associated with last things. Peter says it's associated with the passion of the natural order, which will take place when the Lord comes as a thief in the night, 2 Peter 3, 10 through 12. And uh, remember, the coming of the Lord is associated with last things. Matthew 25 10 in the parable of the ten virgins associates the coming of the Lord with the entrance of the saved and the closing of the door. Amen. Acts 17 31 connects it with the day of judgment. 1 Corinthians 15 52 says it's the, the last trump will sound, the last one. Revelation 1, 7 says, Every eye shall see him for the first time. Time all together and for the last time. <laughs> the wicked will be punished when Jesus comes again. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 10. There he says the wicked will be punished when he comes to be glorified in them that believe. And that when Jesus comes again, the saved will be like, like him, for they shall see him as he is. We'll be transformed by the sight of him. Yes. There is not in Scripture any clear teaching that earthly history will in any sense continue after Jesus comes. Amen. Now, there are a lot of theologians, a lot of preachers, a lot of theologies that say that there will be a considerable amount of history in the world with flesh and blood after Jesus comes. I will just come right out and say it. All of those things are lies. Amen. Amen. They are not true. Jesus has already appeared in flesh and blood to people in flesh and blood and he is not going to do it again. Amen. Once in the end of the world he appeared mm -hmm. uh -huh. to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The next time is the end of everything Amen. as we know it. The end of earthly history. The end of flesh and blood. The end of insurrection end of opposition. Yeah. See, the Lord's coming is associated with these things. God. Now, in particular, we're going to be speaking tonight about the association of the coming of Christ with the resurrection of the dead. Not some dead. The resurrection of, quote, all that are in the graves. Yeah. The word resurrection is never in the plural mm. in Scripture. Scripture nowhere speaks about resurrections. Right, Someone says, well, what about first resurrection? Yes, but you never read second resurrection. The first resurrection is the resurrection of a different order. It's a different kind of resurrection. We're speaking about the resurrection of the dead, which is the, it's the resurrection of the body from the graves. Now, the ancient people that before Scripture was written and some during the age of, uh, of the law, they had a sense of this, but there really, there really wasn't much of this known before Christ. 
Some of the ancients, they, they sensed this. They sensed that things can't end with death, but they didn't have much insight into after death. Job said this, Job 19, 25 through 27. I know. <clears throat> now, this is intuitive knowledge. That is, it, this is built in the human makeup. Now, some people manage to stifle it. But Job didn't. I know that my Redeemer liveth. Yeah, this is before there ever was a Redeemer. <laughs> and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And then he connects it with his resurrection. And that, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself. And mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Though my natural yeah. constitution is... Uh -huh. See, so that's a very veiled... I mean, you don't want to build a theology on that expression. That's right. A detailed... That would be more precise. You don't want to build a detailed theology on that expression. He just knew that he wasn't... When he died, that wasn't the end of his dealing with God. He... He knew he was going to have to face God after he died. Now, he knew that without a Bible, he knew that. And David, he also, he knew, he knew about this. And it didn't, they didn't know a lot. You don't, you don't go to Job and David to find out the details about the resurrection of the dead. They didn't know very much about this at all, but they knew something. David said, Psalm 17, 15, As for me, we say, speaking for myself, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. See, that, that's, about all he, that's about all he knew. But he knew that death wasn't the conclusion of everything. I'm going to awake. Let's see. It was a resurrection of the dead. What we know that to be resurrection, but this is—he just knew when I what, when I'm buried, I'm, I'm going to come back. Mm -hmm. Again, he said, Psalm forty-nine, fifteen: God shall redeem my soul from the power of the grave. Yeah. Yeah. So it's amazing that he knew this, Amen. and that a lot of people today, not only do they not know it, they don't want to know it. And the church today does not talk much at all about the resurrection of the dead. That's right. This is a very, very rare subject in our society. But it wasn't so in the early church, let me tell you. So there's Job and David. They're about, that's about the only examples we have of someone that had an inkling about the resurrection. They, they knew that death couldn't end it all. Now, the prophets, they, they talked about it. Not a lot. Not even the prophets talked about it a lot. But they talked about it. Isaiah, he, this is revealed to him now. Isaiah 25, 8. He, that's God, shall swallow up death in victory. And the Lord will wipe away all tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. See, as long as there's death, there's rebuke. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's going to do away with it. Isaiah, he's going to swallow up death. It's like there's two predators, like death and life. Life's going to eat up death. Death's not going to eat up. See, it looks like death is doing the consumer. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Right? It looks like death overtakes life. That's what it looks like, but... No, he says he's going to swallow up death in victory. In Isaiah 26, 19, Thy dead men shall live. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust. For thy dew is as the dew of the herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. How's that? <laughs> it's the ministry the earth's going to have. It's going to, it's going to vomit out the dead. 
all of them at one time. Just <laughs> you see that? Now, to, compared to what you know, this is not very much. But it was enough. They, they banked on this. Amen. They banked on this happening, as sparse amount of information as they had. They banked on this. Daniel, he, uh, he was given to see something about this. Daniel 12, 2. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. They that be wise shall shine as the brightness in the of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever. Yeah, uh -huh. So it may look like the righteous are losing. It's not over yet. Amen. It may look like the people who are seeking after God, like they're in the minority and they're not doing too well and they're overcome, but it, it's not over yet. Amen. They're going to come back. The dead are coming back, and so it's going to be payday for everybody. Right. Some are going to come back to everlasting life and some to everlasting sh to shame and everlasting contempt. Contempt. I say contempt. Now we can say God loved the world, but I'm not going to say God loved these people. Uh -huh. yes. yeah. Amen. Whatever you may think about yeah. God's love, and whatever you may think about God loving people, uh -huh. after the resurrection of the dead, there's a section of people that will in no sense be loved by God. Amen. Right. And not in any sense. Yes. They're going to have everlasting shame and contempt. Yes. Right. And Hosea, Hosea, he knew about this. He, even the, the prophets, it wasn't a lot said about this, Hosea 13, 14. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. They talks to death. Oh, death, I will be thy plagues. He looks at the grave and says, Oh, grave, I'll be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. I'm not changing my mind on this. I'm going to decimate death. But God can do this. And I'm going to make render the grave obsolete. I'm going to end. There will be no more graves. I'm going to bring it to an end. That's what the prophets knew about the resurrection of the dead. Well, it, wasn't, it wasn't much, was it? Not much, but they knew. Now, if you don't have any other reason for being godly and for being separate from the world, if you don't have any other reason, this is reason enough. The dead are going to be raised. That's reason enough. You're going to face God however you lived. You're going to face God and give an account to him. And God, just to make sure you do, he's going to raise the dead. Amen. It's a very prominent part of uh, early preaching. When Jesus came, uh, the pace picked up and talking about the resurrection of the dead. When Jesus came, this subject became uh, more common. Matthew twenty-two thirty, he says, In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead, have you not read that which was spoken to you by the God saying, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Now he said he said that touching the resurrection of the dead. Uh -huh. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. <laughs> what do you mean? He's not the God of the dead. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob aren't really dead. That's right. And whoever's not really dead is going to make an appearing again. That's right. uh -huh. Solomon knew practically nothing about this. This just wasn't in the things revealed to Solomon. This was not among them. And most of the prophets didn't know much about it either. But they seemed to sense it. They seemed to sense 
that more is involved in man being in the image of God than meets the eye. By making a creature that's in his image, I'm going to suggest that that's a creature that cannot be annihilated. Uh I will admit that's my own view, but. I don't think it's possible to annihilate some a personality that's in the image of God. And destroy, in this case, destroy means rendered useless or having no purpose. So Jesus, see, I gave you an example. Jesus affirmed the resurrection of the dead. And when he was visited Mary and Martha at the time Lazarus died, Martha knew She knew about the resurrection. He said, your brother's going to live again. She said, John 11, 24, I know that he shall rise in the resurrection at the last day. Remarkable statement for the times. She had to be paying attention to Jesus when he spoke. She was one of the people that was following Jesus. She had to pay attention. How would she have known that? I know. You don't hear people talk like this today. As a rule, the common people. They don't talk like this. But see, so they're way behind Martha, in other words. <laughs> they're, way, they're not caught up to Martha yet. She said, I know, I know. My brother's coming back. I know that. And I know it's going to be at the last day. It's going to be the last. She Even she knew that. This is a righteous man, right? Was not right to Lazarus a righteous man? She said he would come forth at the last, the last day. Not a a day a thousand years before the last day, the last day. He's going to come forth at the last day. And the apostles, they preached the resurrection of the dead. Acts 4.2, this agitated the temple dignitaries, they were grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection of the dead. See, they preached the resurrection of the dead. They preached the resurrection of the dead. They made sure people knew that the dead are going to be raised. Uh God's going to call into account all of the priests and teachers that have not kept this before the people. Yes. Amen. If this is delivered in power, the dead are going to be raised. If this is delivered in power, it will curtail ungodliness. Yes. Yeah. Amen. It will motivate people. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's not over till it's over, uh-huh. someone said. Amen. And Paul preached the resurrection of the dead, even to, even to philosophers. He told them this. Acts 17, 32. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, that's what Paul would preach it. When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Some others said, we'll hear thee again on this matter. We'll, let's schedule another meeting and hear a little, get a little more information about this resurrection of the dead. See, there's some church people that are really confused about the resurrection of the dead. Uh, if you've ever spent time talking to Christian people about the resurrection, which I suspect that a lot of people haven't, you will soon find out there's a tremendous amount of confusion on this subject. But see, they, Paul... To heathen philosophers, he talked about the resurrection of the dead, and this was woo, this was way outside the borders of their religion. <laughs> yeah. They didn't know anything about that. You know, some of them believe in reincarnation, and, mm-hmm. but resurrection isn't reincarnation. That's right, yes. Amen. See, a lot of heathen religions believe you come back as a fly or a bug or maybe an elephant, depending on what kind of person you were. But we're not that's not the type of thing we're talking about here. The epistles talked about the resurrection of the dead. The epistle of 1 Corinthians in the 15th chapter, the whole chapter is devoted to this because some peop- some teachers 
had taught the Corinthians after they'd been converted that there was no resurrection. Yes. And the Corinthians had swallowed it. Yes. Amen. Yeah. So Paul devotes a chapter to reason about it. He says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 21. Since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the dead. As Jesus was raised, then they that follow him, they'll be raised. 1 Corinthians 15, 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead, it, the body, is sown in corruption, it decays, is raised in incorruption. At the resurrection. So he's talking about the resurrection. It's a different, it's a different, different body. What goes into the grave isn't what comes out. Philippians 3.11 Paul said, if by any means, I've counted everything but lost, you know, I pressed toward the mark, so if by any means I might attain mm -hmm. unto the resurrection of the dead. Now, what the, if all the dead are going to be raised, what does it mean to attain unto the resurrection of the dead? It means the resurrection of the dead is a plus for you. It means you gain an advantage by the team. For some people, the, the ultimate disadvantage of being raised from the dead. That'll be the ultimate disadvantage Amen. that the damned experience. They, are, they would to God, they didn't come back. Yes. If they could have just passed away and went into oblivion in the grave, they'd be very happy. Yes. God's not going to let that happen. They're coming Amen. back. Do you want to attain unto the resurrection of the dead? I mean, like, have you thought about this? Isn't it a isn't it a tremendous incentive? Haven't you found this amen. to be a great incentive? Yes, amen. Amen. Now you don't want to let other people get you drawn off into other other matters, yeah. religious matters, get amen. all immersed into other uh -huh. Uh -huh. matters that when the dead are raised won't mean anything. Mm, that's right. After the resurrection of the dead, there are some things they aren't going to be any kind of issue at all right. when the dead are raised. And the resurrection of the dead is part of the principles of the doctrine. These are, this is part of the rudiments or foundations of the doctrine. Hebrews 6, 2, he mentions some of these rudiments or principles. And up among them were, was the resurrection of the dead. That's a, like nobody who's a Christian should be ignorant about this. Amen. This is a rudiment. That's a that's an ABC we'd say. It's some of the first things you learn. It's some of the very first things you learn. But for some Christians, this is one of the last things they learn. Why? Well, because they're being taught by people that don't know what they're talking about. That's why. And Paul reasons this way: it's a reasonable. The resurrection is reasonable. It says in 1 Corinthians 6, 14, God hath both raised up the Lord mm -hmm. and will also raise up us by his own power. Amen. Yes. So this makes perfect, perfect sense. You can't preach a resurrected Christ mm -hmm. and not a resurrected saved people. Mm -hmm. he, he raised up Christ. He, he's going to raise up us. Your job, get ready. Amen. Yeah. Get ready for the resurrection. It's going to happen. <laughs> now, <clears throat> exactly what is involved in the resurrection of the dead? That's you want to look at this. Christ's coming is related to the resurrection of the dead. For the saved, the resurrection of the dead would be the time of ultimate satisfaction. The psalmist put it this way. He said it intuitively and without the large, broad spectrum of truth we have. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied yes. when I awake with thy likeness. Now listen now, brethren. All dissatisfaction is because there's a sense in which you do not bear his likeness now. Right? All dissatisfaction can be traced to that. And whatever's making me dissatisfied in this matter, I'm not like the Lord yet. 
So you can say this with David with a lot more mm -hmm. insight and persuasion. Now I'll be satisfied when I wake with my likeness. Until then, I don't like this satisfaction, but I'm not surprised yeah. that, that I have it. Because <laughs> you're not going to be without it until the dead are raised. So ultimate satisfaction. And in the resurrection, you'll be redeemed from the power of the grave. Psalm 49, 15. My God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave. Why will he do that? For he shall receive me. Selah. Let's meditate on that for a while. Hosea, some years later, spoke the same way. Hosea 13, 14. I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I'll redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. See, the grave has power. Yeah, uh -huh. oh. You know, believe it, these graveyards out here have been here for a long time. That's right. uh -huh. Tombstones, these tombstones never become obsolete. Mm -hmm. Someone may come and steal a body or steal a coffin or something like that, but... He's going to destroy the power of the grave. The, up, to, up to this time, the grave has swallowed up everybody, except the one, except those that are alive now. It's swallowed up everybody else, except two people. That's right. Enoch and Elijah. They're the only two people. Death even, Jesus even went into the abode of the yeah, dead. Uh -huh. yeah. Of course, he came back from it. He took back his own life. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Good and old. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> The death will be swallowed up in victory, and the earth is going to cast out her dead. Mm -hmm. The new heavens, the new earth, they can't have dead. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can't have any dead. So before there's a new heavens, a new earth, going to, this earth is going to cast out yeah. the dead. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 26, 19, thy dead men shall live. Mm -hmm. Together with my body shall they rise. Awake and sing. He talks to the people in the grave. Walk down the graveyard and talk to it. Talk to the people. You can do this. But be edifying to actually do this. You might have to check and make sure no one's watching just so you won't have a reproach. Yeah. Say, Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. You're coming out of there. Oh, yeah. You probably, there will probably not be a very many days in your life when you won't drive past a graveyard. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's good just to think this when you go past. Yeah. Just kind of shout it out. Awake and sing, you need to the dust. Your day's coming. The earth's going to cast out mm -hmm. like vomit out. I get the idea that the earth is kind of offended by the fact that it has to bear the dead. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. The earth is made for the living. Amen. <laughs> the, yeah. Yeah. So the new heavens and new earth, it, it's not going to have any dead in it. So the earth is going to cast out, vomit about. See, the earth has a stewardship to keep the dead till Jesus comes. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Talk about their bodies now. And then bombing them out. See, it's going to happen when at the resurrection of the dead. I'm commenting on what's involved in the dead being raised. And when the dead are raised, there's two differing destinies when the dead are raised. It isn't like all the saved are raised, then a thousand years pass, and then all the wicked are raised. Men teach this. But they've not told the truth. This was revealed to Daniel. Many of the, many in this case me, means many as compared to one or two or three. Mm -hmm. Romans 5 uses the word many to a, that same way. It's speaking of everybody, actually. Yeah, uh -huh. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Mm -hmm. Some to everlasting life. Some to shame and everlasting contempt. They that be wise. <laughs> 
Well, wait till that day happens. Yeah. They that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars forever and ever. Think how many people, Paul, for instance, turn to righteousness. Yeah. Uh -huh. uh, how many do you suppose you've turned to righteousness? It's just good to think about, you know. Yeah. We're not sitting in judgment on anybody, but it is good to think about how many people have you turned to righteousness? Did you become famous because you did? You will be famous. Yes, amen. Good shine. Amen. I'm, con I'm, I'm content now to be obscure. Because God's the resurrection, no more obscurity. Amen. Now, Jesus, he elaborated on this, the, almost the same language <laughs> that was given to Daniel. John 5, 28 and 29. Marvel not at this. He said, the, marvel not at this that he spoke. He said that they, they that hear the Son of, God, Son of God will live. He's talking about conversion. They that hear shall live. Mm -hmm. He said, marvel not at this. For the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. One, one voice, one utterance. All that hear and shall come forth, they that have done good. Isn't that interesting that he said it that way? This is Jesus said it this way. You think they that have believed, they that were righteous. Jesus said it. He said they that have done good. Yeah, right. What he said is what Jesus said. Yeah. It will no, none of us can do good. Well, then, why did he say that? They that have done good to the resurrection of life. They that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. So two different destinies, see? Yes. This is what's going to happen now at the resurrection of the dead. Two different, two different destinies. One resurrection, it's in the singular, one resurrection, two different destinies. Jesus also told us something about the resurrection. Matthew 22, 30. In the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. So no more marriage. Mm -hmm. yeah. Enjoy your marriage now because there isn't going to be any on the other side. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Go be in marriage. Not, not like our marriage. It'll be yeah. a bride will marry the bridegroom. Yeah. The lamb's wife will marry the lamb. That's the only marriage there's going to be. So marriage is going to be obsolete. So how, if this is true, how can there be life in the flesh after? And here's another thing about the resurrection. What will happen when the dead are raised? The righteous will be recompensed. That's payday. Luke 14, 14. Thou shalt be blessed for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. Yeah. Amen. So don't expect to reap all the benefits for being righteous now. Yes. You're going to be recompensed at the resurrection Amen. of the just. All men are going to be raised, but see, all men aren't going to be raised alike. It will be two different destinies. And the resurrection, that will be like the culmination of salvation. That's the justified, sanctified, glorified. That's going to be wrapped up when the dead are raised. John 6, 44. No man can come unto me except the Father which has sent me draw him. That's the initiation. Then the culmination. And I will raise him up at the last day. Now in Genesis we read about the first day. The evening and the morning were the first day. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. But there's a last day. Uh -huh. And Jesus said, I'm going to raise him up at the last day. First, the Father draws him to me. Mm -hmm. And I'm their custodian. I'm the captain of their salvation. I'm going to do a work in them. Then I'm going to raise them up at the last day. And then the res what's going to happen to the resurrection? The sons of God are going to be manifested. Mm -hmm. Now, some, some people you can tell. But you do have to kind of study it out. Because there's a certain level of 
Christi Christian living, for want of a better term, it's a certain level you can be in the flesh and do and do it. And it looks pretty good. You love your neighbors yourself. You do a bit of self-sacrifice and do some good and read your Bible. And but there's some things that just you, it can't be seen thoroughly. But Romans 8.19 tells us that the, the creation who had been consigned to mortality also. See, if man was consigned to die, then his environment had to die also. You couldn't have a dying man in an immortal environment. <laughs> This can't be. So the environment for men, it had to become corrupt. But the creature, the earnest expectation of the creation, it, there's some way in which it senses that it's going to be liberated. And sometimes you have an ear for it. If you kind of can listen to nature, it's kind of a moaning that's going on. And Romans 8.19 tells you what it's all about. The earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. He goes on to tell you that when the sons of God are liberated, creation is going to be liberated yes, too. Amen. Amen. All right, now I dedicate this to all premillennialists. Yes. If when the children of God, if there is such a thing as the first resurrection, a gap of a thousand years and the next resurrection, we got quite a dilemma here now because the, the creation, it thinks that when the sons of God are liberated, it's going to be liberated too. Uh -huh. yeah. That's right. All right? Uh -huh. But that's not what this doctrine teaches. Even these people that teach this doctrine, they know the earth's not going to continue on forever and ever like it is. But they got to deal with this. Yes. The creation, unless the creation is wrong, yeah. unless the creation has, a, has an improper expectation, if it has no right to expect that when the sons of God are liberated, it'll be liberated, maybe it's wrong about this. Well... It's not because verse 21 elaborates, Romans 8, 21, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. That is, the children of God are going to take over Amen. That's right. the creation. <laughs> but these people teach this other doctrine. They got a war going on in the world. After the righteous are raised, after they're with the Lord, they got a war going on on earth. Battle. They don't have the sons of God have to fight to win. But they're going to listen. The glorious liberty of the children of God doesn't include fighting. Yeah, amen. That's right. We admit, we admit, we fight now. Yeah. If you want to see us fight, just oppose us. You want to see us fight? Just take a stand against us. I'll just speak for myself. I'm not afraid of them. Amen. That make a difference who they are. We got access to all wisdom. They got access to no wisdom. See? Now the resurrection of the dead, what's going to happen with the resurrection? It's going to be a different kind of body. A different kind of body. <laughs> that's how new is used in scripture new means different kind the new testament different kind of testament new covenant is a different kind of covenant new song is a different kind of song new heart is a different kind of heart new spirit is a different kind of spirit so someone in, they were confused in Corinth about the resurrection of the dead Paul said now some man will say <laughs> I can almost see him snickering under his breath some man will say how are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? I've, I've had discussions about this, this exact question right here. I could name you names, but I won't do it, because the man's still alive, so I don't want to humiliate him. Maybe he's changed. That ask this very question. What kind of body is it going to be? 
Paul says, thou fool. It's a dumb question. Thou fool. That which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not the body that shall be. Amen. Different kind of body. Amen. But but bare grain. You don't you don't you don't sow a pear. You sow a pear of seed. That's right. <laughs> and that seed doesn't look anything like a pear. Uh -huh. The different Amen. different kind. It, by chance, maybe of wheat or some other grain. But God giveth it a body as it pleased him to everyone's own, every seed his own body. So there are different. it's a different kind of body, but different kind of seeds yield a different body. A grain of wheat yields a different kind of thing than a, some of these tall cedar trees. Different, different kind of body. Now it continues. Remember what we're saying is a different it's a different kind of body. All flesh is not the same flesh. It is, I was commenting on different kind of kinds of bodies. There's one kind of flesh uh, of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. So they're not all the same kind of body. They're different. And there's, a, there's celestial bodies, stars, sun, moon, stars, planets, and bodies uh, terrestrial on earth. But the glory of the celestial is one kind of glory, we say, and the glory of terrestrials and others, a different kind. He's, he's established a different kind. And we should not balk at this because we're living in a natural universe that has different kinds of, of bodies. Yes, yeah. And there's, a, there's one glory of the sun, mm -hmm. another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, and one star differs from another in glory. So it's a different kind of body, but then the, the, it manifests itself in different ways also. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It's a different kind of body. It's sown in corruption. Mm -hmm. It's raised in incorruption. Mm -hmm. That's as different as a star is from a rock. That's right, yeah. It is sown in dishonor. No one keeps the dead bodies at home. That's right, yeah. Well, when I was a boy, you used to have a, you'd have the body would stay in your living room at home for a few days, three, about three days. We, that was before we had air conditioning, so I didn't have to do this. But my father used to have to get up at night. The young men had to get up at night and pour alcohol on the dead body to keep the stench down. It's, it's sold in corruption. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no one thing, no one lingers around dead bodies for long. It's, it, it decays. It stinketh, as Martha would say. Sown in uh, dishonor is raised in glory. It's sown in weakness is raised in power. It's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. Spiritual here doesn't mean intangible. It's going to be a real body. You don't have like an intangible body. I bet you can understand it. There's no such thing as a star that has a body that can't be in some way seen. <laughs> there's a natural body and there's a spiritual body, two different kind of bodies. So you don't want to get caught up in some kind of argument about the body. But it's just different. That's the point. It's different. Yes. It's got to be different because you're different. <laughs> That's right. See, what's, 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 what's raised up is your body. And your, your spirit says, Jim, that sleep Jesus is going to bring with him. She's going to bring the spirits back with him of the redeemed. They're going to inhabit these new bodies. So you can't have a redeemed spirit after the resurrection dwelling in a corruptible body. That's, right, yeah. That's what happens now. It's a different kind of body. 
And you, you must really think about this, brothers and sisters. You must ponder this. Because for some of us, our present bodies are giving us a lot of trouble. And you can be, have, achieve a, a good degree of peace by thinking, yeah, but this isn't my final body. Amen. This is just my temporal body. In fact, I would, I will go so far as to say that all of your moral and spiritual liabilities are traceable to your body. Amen. And, and the spirit that dwells in it. Your soul dwells in it, but it's, it's the body. Once, once we're free from this body, ha, whew, boy, Amen. I'm going to fly away. Now, David said, well, I had the wings of a dove. I'd fly away and be at rest. Well, the resurrection is flying away. Amen. And we'll be leaving the death behind. So the grave and death are dissipated at the resurrection. We'll say, death, if you can hear me, where is your sting now? Hmm? See, death is the result of being stung. Where is your sting now? And, O grave, where is your victory now? See, brethren, after the dead are raised, there ain't going to be any more grave. Death, which is the word grave, and hell, which is all about Hades are going to be cast into the lake of fire. That's what Revelation says. Yeah. It's going to be cast into the lake of fire. And the resurrection of the dead is going to introduce its judgment. When the dead are raised, not a portion of the dead. Well, here's what Revelation 20, 13 says. The sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged. They were judged? That's why they were raised. They were judged. Every man according to their works. So that's some things that's going to that are associated with the resurrection of the dead. Those are a few things I showed you there. And one final point I want to want to make. That when the righteous dead are raised. At that point, death will be defeated. And this is the point of 1 Corinthians 15. He says that the Lord's going to come in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. That's those that are alive and remain, as they're said in 1 Thessalonians. We're, so he's talking about now, he's talking clearly about the resurrection of the righteous at this point. <coughs> And he tells the righteous about the, this is the re resurrection of the righteous. This corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. That's the righteous now he's talking about. In 1 Corinthians 15, this ought to be, this has to be clear to you. You've got to see this, righteous. And when they are raised, then shall come to pass the saying. <laughs> this is 1 Corinthians 15, 52 through 54. Then shall be brought to pass the saying is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So when the righteous are delivered, the grave is nullified. Amen. Death is forever gone. Amen. So you can't say that it's going to be a thousand years of history afterward and a bunch of wars, a bunch of tribulation, and the Antichrist is going to come to see many. Death is going to be, out. there isn't going to be any wars killing no one will be able to kill anybody. Amen. The death will be obsolete. That's when the righteous are raised. Amen. I don't know how a person could successfully contradict that. Then in 1 Corinthians 15, 52 through 54, he's speaking about the resurrection, but he particularly focuses on the righteous. And he says, then, he doesn't mean for the righteous death to be swallowed up. It's going to be finally, once and for all, Amen. swallowed up <coughs> in victory. So the new will not be created, incidentally, from the old. God's not going to take 
some part, a little chunk of the old body and make a new body. It's going to be a totally new body. Mm -hmm. yes. 2 Corinthians 5 says it's a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Yes. And we're, uh, we're waiting for it. To know there will be a, a resurrection, to know this, and not to prepare for it, is the ultimate insanity. Yeah. Because Jesus told us, the apostles have told us about the resurrection. They made clear that there's no history after the resurrection. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Mm -hmm. Death's going to be, it's all going to be wrapped up, yeah. the resurrection of the dead. Amen. The earth's going to know it's got to go. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to cast out the dead. Yeah. It knows that when the sons of God are made known, and they're going to be made known at the resurrection, then we shall see him as he is. That's First John 3. Yeah. So that there isn't going to be any more grave there's going to be any more death that's a perfect uh, environment now to give an account for your life yes. yeah. Amen. Right? Correct. so I I bid you to uh, take these things seriously Amen. if it's hard to understand mm -hmm. ask God to help you but uh, understand it the way it's declared mm -hmm. yeah. understand the way it's declared Learn to be dissatisfied with your body. Yes, amen. You've got to use it. for it, it belongs to Christ. He purchased your body. He purchased it. He hadn't redeemed it yet, but he's purchased it. So learn to uh, don't, don't get, give in to the desires of the body. Keep your body in subjection. Bring it under subjection. Make it serve you, not you it. But do so in expectation that this is a temporal arrangement. Now, three score and ten, uh, by reason of strength, four score, sounds pretty good in this. Now, what if you were Methuselah and God said, look, all you people are 35, you know, just got 925 years to go. Do you imagine what that do to you? See, David, he, he had a longing. He was, he was dissatisfied with a present arrangement, not because he was cast reproach on God, but because he didn't have a tabernacle adequate to meet his desires. So he looked forward to being freed from it, and uh, and I do too. Amen. Who has our exhortation? Oh, Brother Gene. Okay. Mm -hmm.